So today I am here with Peter Miller. He is one of the top nutritionists in the world. Peter, can you just give people a little bit of a rundown of who you are and who you work with currently? So first of all, thanks for having me on. Um, so I'm the owner of a company called Condition Nutrition. So I work predominantly with fighters, um, MMA, kickboxers, Muay Thai. Majority of my work is with Muay Thai and one championship. So I've got the likes of Jonathan Haggerty, Superlek, Nico Carrillo, Liam Hannison, Smilla Sundell, and um, Pechida. Um, there's probably people that are completely forgetting, but there. <laughs> so I've got I've got about probably about 25, 30 people in one championship. Um, and yeah, my my job in a nutshell is to get them on weight, feeling good. Hopefully they perform good, and yeah, and um, been doing this for about two and a half years now so yeah it's um wow it's been pretty busy in the past especially the past year it's 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 gone crazy in terms of like the clients that i've got and the fights that i've been to so it's a yeah it's a, it's a cool job yeah so like what was your initial i guess introduction to the sport um i'd always been kind of around the sport like my friends um one of my friends was in in the ufc i had a friend who was a boxer so i was always kind of around that space as a kid, did a little bit of Thai boxing, a little bit of jiu-jitsu, um, just a general interest in sport. And then um, I finished my, my degree. I wanted to work with athletes. It wasn't necessarily fighters. Hmm. And I kind of fell into just working with fighters. One fighter started uh, reaching out to me, and then it went from that uh, recommendation, recommendation, and then, yeah, just continually niched it down. And now it's predominantly, yeah, um, predominantly fighters I work with now and it's 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 gone from like a passion to like on the scale of like it's just it's just it's just exploded in terms of my passion for this and um I feel like I've got the best the best job in the world that I can travel, watch people get punched in the face, get them on weight and yeah, <laughs> it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, so I mean obviously you've had some major wins. You know, Haggerty knocking out Nong O was absolutely insane and he looked great. And that's kind yeah. of one of the things I wanted to start talking about um, is, you know, his decision to move up in a weight class. Because a lot of people were, you know, doubtful that he would be able to not only get the job done, but to get it done in the fashion that he did to carry so much power up in a weight class. You know, and we saw what he he had some legendary fights with Rod Tang, but wasn't able to actually get the job done as far as like especially finishing him, you know, and then yeah. to. What what a lot of people would perceive as a tougher opponent and a stronger, bigger opponent, you know, yeah, in Nong O, to see him absolutely crush him is insane. You know, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so I I actually first started to work with John when it was his decision to move up in weight. Um, he'd had a couple of issues in the past with um, making weight and hydration. Um, him and Christian reached out to me. Um, he had the first day, first fight at bantamweight set. Um, and yeah, it was it was quite an easy transition for him really because making flyweight, he was he was from what he was telling me, it was it was a bit of a struggle for him. Um and I think the first fight of Bantamweight was he probably looked I wouldn't say small for the weight, but he probably didn't look like a bantamweight at first. And then he naturally adjusted that when it when it was a non-go fight, he, he focused on his S and C. Um a little bit more muscle, and then when it came to the non-go fight, he 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 looked like a bantamweight. He actually looked, you know, I remember the commentary from Mitch saying he he looks massive in there, and the, the complete comparison to the last time. And now he's like, he doesn't cut a lot of weight. He he makes it easy. He, his like, I, my work with him is quite relaxed. He he cracks on with his work and um, with with his food and his training. And you know, if he needs me, I've got that kind of overseeing help there and that's like the ideal scenario where he knows he can make the way comfortably, knows what foods to eat now. And he's just, yeah, yeah he's um, he's the man in one championship at the moment. It's, it's great to see the the, tran the transition from, you know, he, he missed weight a couple of times and fly weight and people, you know, potentially wrote him off a little bit. And then when the non-go fight, people say he's got absolutely no chance. And I always, I remember saying to people, I've just got a feeling he's going to do it. I, I just had the feeling that something was going to happen. And it was like absolutely no chance. Like, especially the UK Muay Thai scene was like absolutely no chance. I was like, I've just got a feeling he's going to do it, and then he did it, and mm -hmm. um, it's it's great to see because he's he's top lad to work with too, and um, 
yeah, now he's, he, he's, he's kind of the man of one championship now. Yeah. And so, you know, like you said, it's an ideal situation. When teams bring you in, obviously, there's probably a different dynamic that happens depending on who you're working with. You yeah. know, what's it like with, I guess, you know, Haggerty, his team, when they call you in, what's like your role? You know, and is there like a general position, like the general who commands all these things and you just find where you fit in the best and like at what capacity do you work with him? And, you know, like you said, he calls you when he needs you. Yeah, I think, yeah, it's it's, it's different for a lot of people. Some people require a bit more of a hands-on approach where they need like a set meal plan and they like to follow something set in stone and and they follow to a T. And then some people like, well, I just want that guidance there. A little bit of advice a couple of times a week. Um, it all really depends on the individual. I, I look at it as, you know, a lot of fighters that I work with, I don't completely overhaul the dice, you know, when they come to me. I try and look at it and go, right, you could be getting 90, 90 things out of 100, right? And it could just mm-hmm. be a little little tweaks here and there that we that we can do. Some people might be on the, the lower end of the scale where they're not getting a lot right, and I have to do a bit more, <laughs> a bit more of an intervention. But it, mm-hmm. it tends to be at the, at the, at the higher level that, they're getting the majority of things right. It's just them little tweaks here and there. And in 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 that kind of like top level, it is the the one to ten percent, which could be the difference between winning and losing. Yeah. What kind of what kind of um I guess dieting plan is he on, you know, during his training camp? Like what's he eating? How much is he eating? How often does he train? So when he's in Samiri, he usually does two sessions a day, one in the morning, one in the evening. John doesn't like to really train on a full stomach. He typically trains in the morning, um, maybe something light or something like a sports drink or a coffee. And he likes to eat post-training. There's a cafe across the road where he's training, like a healthy cafe. So it's ideal for him out there where, you know, they do like healthy, you know, burrito bowls, like um, smoothie bowls. So as long as he's hitting the fundamentals, he's getting, you know, his carbs for recovery, the protein's high, he's, he's having protein shakes throughout the day, and um, to hit them protein targets, he's getting his, um, like, lean meat, he's getting his red meat in. Um, so we typically have, like, two, three meals a day, and in terms of, like, the calorie intake, it varies, but he's, it, it, it's sometimes been, like, the 2,500 calorie mark, um, mm. but he... The thing is with John, it's like very he's he's very relaxed with nutrition. Like some days he he might not feel like he wants a lot and he, he the next day he might make up for that. Um and sometimes a lot of people think, well, as a nutritionist, you've got to go, right, you've got to do this, 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 and this. And sometimes if that works, if that works for him and he's happy yeah. and the meat's good, then that's 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 all good for me. And I think what yeah. I learned from when I first start off, is that you're coming in with the pe- the notepad and pen. You're the nutritionist. You've got to you've got to hit the 50 grams of carbs post training. You've got to have the 20 grams of yeah. protein. And in the real life scenario, you, you work with human beings, not robots. And some people yes. don't want to eat before training. Some people don't want to, and particularly hungry after training. And you've got to kind of go, okay, well, you know, if it, if it works you, then uh, and and we're and we're hitting them targets, then that's all good. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's that's a true tailored way to, to handle and approach the game, you know. Yeah. Uh, like you're talking about, each athlete is a completely different person. They have a different fighting style. They have a different mindset. They have a different focus, you know, in the ring. And so outside of the ring, a lot of their personality. I mean, you know, you talk about just making it so that they can do this for a long time, you know, so yeah. that they can continue to do this. A lot of fighters, if they are so strict and regimented, and you see it as, especially – around times when they have big fights, as soon as they get off those big fights, they balloon yeah. up and then yeah. it immediately becomes like a process where I think you, you had put it in that term fat camp, you know, that first yeah. like three weeks is totally just to figure out how to not be a fat dude anymore and yeah. just get back to the, to the position where it's like, okay, now these workouts are actually beneficial when really it's, it's like, you know, every serious athlete, basically, especially because there's no real seasons in fighting. So mm-hmm. it's like, you don't have this like off season. You shouldn't anyways. Fighting's already a, sh- a short shelf life. So to yeah. make that even shorter by having to take a longer time in between because of all this stuff is, you know, insane. What's his walk away, uh, walk around weight usually? He's usually like um, mid to low, low 70s. So he, he walks around at like a pretty comfortable weight. And the weight yeah. 
terms of watercolor, he doesn't do much of a watercolor. It's all pretty, yeah. It's a, um, it's kind of the dream scenario for a nutritionist, where it's just everything. Yeah. There's no, there's no. Now let's talk about obviously. You don't have to say the names. Now let's talk about the opposite scenario. So it's like you know these people who are the most challenging, and and you you got you know come across them multiple times. Obviously, obviously it's tough to work with these people, but you have to make it work at times. And and also, also yeah. I'm sure you enjoy a challenge. So it's like, what are some of the common things that you see as far as the people who are harder to work with? Um, I think what you mentioned about the the, the finish the fight and it's yeah. We finished the fight, won or lost, and let's go on a big holiday and yeah. balloon up. And then, you know, they start to fight that, you know, a kilo heavier than the previous camp. And it's trying to have that conversation with them and saying, look, we can't for the, you know, you can do this for a couple of camps, you know, but doing it like continuously, it's just going to get harder yeah. and harder. And I've been in scenarios where, you know, First couple of times you can get away with it, and then that last that last time it's just that little bit more difficult. Mm. We're cutting that little bit more water, and the body's just that little bit more resistance. And you can you can dial in all the numbers and say, you know, he's gonna. I'm predicting he's gonna be be this way, this way. And then when it comes to the fight week, I, I've been in scenarios where the the weight just hasn't shifted. The, a lot a lot mm. come off, and it's just that continuous fight. Like they're, they're doing this like three four times a year. The yeah. body. As that kind of, I don't like to say like a survival mechanism, but if you're constantly yeah. losing large amounts of weight, the body's like, fuck this, we need to like, we need to hold on to it. So it's just more resistance. And it's having that conversation either you do this continuously or you move up weight class. Like you can't keep doing this. And like, luckily with the fighters that I've worked with, I've, a lot of fighters have done multiple camps with, and I can have that conversation with sometimes people that it's the first time it's a harder conversation to have because they've got their coach in their ear go, well, don't, don't listen to me. We can get down to it. We can get down to that weight. But when you've got yeah. that relationship to them, they know, yeah, you feel like you've got a bit more pull and say, look, mate, like this is getting a bit out of hand now. Um, yeah. But it's all kind of having that, that trust with, with the coach and a uh, good relationship with the coach and the fighter. Because I always remember when I first started off, I remember telling someone, I don't think he should compete this weight class. And basically, he's coached yeah. me to take off. He just said, like, yeah, he's yeah. fighting that weight. Like, yeah, a lot of times people make you're weight. About. A lot of times people will make that weight that they – just because they can make that weight, they're yeah. like, this is the weight class for me. So when you yeah. talk about choosing the appropriate weight class for you, what are some, like, indications or warning signs that you should probably move up? I think firstly, like your body composition out of camp and you're like very, you're, you're very lean. So you, you, you fight, I always give sound, you're fighting at 70 kilos and you walk around at 85, 84 to 85 and you, you've hardly got any fat on you. And then there's, there's a mm. person B who's the same weight, he's got a little bit of body fat. So they've got actually weight to lose, the person who's, who's lean as, yeah. they're not, where, where are you getting that weight from? It's not, you, you're going to have mm. to tap into your muscle. Um lose a bit of muscle mass, which, which obviously affects, you know, strength parameters in camp, and then you'd end up doing a big water cut. So that's like one of the scenarios. Two is your previous fight camp experiences. Are you cutting, you know, more than 5 6% of your body weight in the water cut in the final 24 hours? Are the calories that you're on throughout your fight camp pretty low? Like how are you feeling psychologically? Like I think a big thing as well is, yeah, you can make that weight, but what, what are you like for... Eight to eight to ten to twelve weeks. Are you an absolutely miserable bastard, hating life? <laughs> not like not a good person to be around. And I think just to get to that weight, is it is it is it worth it? And yeah, I think first I always try and say if someone comes to me new and they and they give me the data and say this is what what a fighter or really struggle. I try and get them to get a body composition assessment just to see you know where they're at because it as you said. A lot of times people go, well, if I fight at 70, why? Oh, because of what? Because your coach has told me to. It's like, well, that doesn't yeah. really give me a lot of information. It's just, yeah, yeah can you get to that weight? But should you make that weight? There's a prime, a prime example of John. Could John potentially go a little bit lower if he, if he, if he was really restricted with his diet, and diet of that much? Potentially, but what's the, what's the point? Yeah. There's, 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 no, there's no point doing that. It's like, like starving yourself for weeks on end where... You've got that relaxed approach. 
Yeah. And the whole fight camp, like me- like mentally, your 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 mental health is just it's so much better. Um, we definitely like body composition, blood work as well, because a lot of fighters have, you know, they don't know about it. They've got like nutritional deficiencies. So mm. I give an example where a fighter came to me. I fight at the same scenario. I fight at this weight class. Why I fight this weight class? So because my coach told me to. Got a body composition assessment. He he was stating that throughout his fight camps, he was, all, he was constantly fatigued. Sleep was terrible. I think right, get some blood work done. And he was pushing back on. I say, look, get it. Kept on pushing back, and then when he eventually got it, he was iron deficient, and we wouldn't have known wow. that until he got blood work. And then we can do something about it. Then we can address that. And um, so that's also an important thing if you're doing big weight cuts, um, regularly, definitely getting some blood work done because there might be some, especially iron and uh, and other nutritional deficiency. So getting that data and going, right, we can work with that instead of going in blind and saying, yeah, you, you fight at 70, let, let's get a plan yeah. going and I'm not having a clue about their current body. Yeah, so two big pieces with people working with you immediately. You recommend they get that body scan. You recommend yeah. they get blood work. And, you know, those things will be, will illuminate a lot of potential problems that like, you yeah. know, without those things, you, you just really can't know. And then the yeah. body fat percentage. So I think you, I, I think I watched something saying that around a week out, if you're around 8% body fat, that's like an ideal percentage, right? Although that's 8% from your fight weight. So like- Fight weight. Yeah, 8% away from your fight weight. Mm, that's like the number. 8% like away you... from my fight weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to, in, in other numbers, what, how many kilograms would that be? Let's say for, let's say Haggy, so... right? He's walking around 70. Something. Um, so eight percent out is about so sixty five point eight. It's a, it's around the sixty nine and a half mark, I think. Mm-hmm. From the top. Of from the head, from what does he walk around at? He's around like seventy three, seventy four. Mm-hmm. So, for the Americans watching my stuff, seventy three <laughs> is one sixty. And then we're going to go to 69 because I know a lot of people say, hey, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> Which is the dumbest system ever. So yeah. we're going from, you know, you know, around 160, 160 to 152. So we're talking about an eight pound difference. Um, that's that's pretty that's pretty good. And yeah, then and obviously you, and the bigger the person. Like from the start of camp, say you've got eight weeks and we want to be around yeah. that number. We just work backwards and go, OK, well, the yeah. weight, weekly weight loss numbers might be a pound a week. To get there when does it start to typically time? get dangerous for most people? Um, it's when you're getting over the ten percent mark. If you're if you're ten percent over ten percent out on fight week, that's when we're going. It's 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 going into the territory where we know we're going to be doing a, a reasonable water court, like a deep, like a mm. pretty big water court. Um, so I'd say like ten to twelve. Anything really over twelve percent is when. It's you know it's going to be a, a bit of a difficult cut because if you say you start fight week twelve percent out and we do the fight week strategies yeah. like carb restriction, sodium, fiber, yeah. then that's probably only taking maybe four or five percent away, and then the rest yeah, you're going yeah. to have to put that in water. So yeah, that's yeah. when it's getting a little bit. Yeah, I've getting... I've cut I've cut quite, I've cut to one thirty five pounds from one fifty eight in water. And that was insane. Oh, I had the that's... biggest head on a th- on a bantamweight. <laughs> I was like, "This yeah. is insane." I did. I did feel like I think I'm dying. You know, just like you could feel your heart. It's like everything is. You just feel so fragile too. It's like if you were to cough hard, it, it's a wrap for you. Like, <laughs> yeah. so water the the rehydration. Let's let's just start with the water cut protocol. Okay. Um, you know, I know what other coaches do. You know, I'm. I I would like to know kind of what your approach is you know, week of the fight. Yeah, so let's give the scenario where someone's eight to ten percent out from the fight weight on fight yep. week. So the the typical start and fight week strategies would be reduce the carbohydrate intake because you store carbohydrates in the body as glycogen. And um, one gram of glycogen typically binds to three grams of water. So if you're having a lot of carbohydrates in fight camp and you, you restrict them on fight week. You, you can potentially lose two, three percent of your body weight by doing that. And then the second strategy would be fiber. So if you're having lots of fruits and vegetables, a lot of fiber gets undigested in the gut. So removing fiber or adopting mm. a low fiber diet, three to five days 
um, out from weigh-ins, you can potentially lose, you know, one to two percent of your body weight. But that's obviously same as carbohydrates. You've got to be eating lots of fiber throughout fight camp for that to be an effective strategy. Oh. Um, third one would be sodium. So when you have sodium, you've probably been for, you know, Asian type meals, and you you wake up the next morning, you you know two kilos heavier because of the sodium yeah. and the yeah. and soy sauce. So, um, adopting a low sodium diet, so them um, having like low sodium type foods, um, for example, like something like behind sodium, be like bacon or cheese, you know, opting for lower sodium foods, you could potentially once again lose one to two percent of your body weight, and then say you've done that, you've lost, you were ten percent out, and say you lost, you know five six percent from doing their strategies the final bit would be the water cut so either yeah. that would be the the day the day of weighing or the night before i typically it all really depends on where the fighter is um, mm-hmm. and also the weighing time so if the if the weighing was at 12 o'clock on the friday and they had I don't know how much had, they had three kilos to lose i'd say okay well we could do a little bit the night before and then the next morning wake up Lose lose a little bit in the sleep, do the rest in the morning. But then, if it was an evening weighing, you, there's not you don't want to, you want to try and limit being dehydrated for as long as possible. So yeah. that's an hour yeah. you you you'd opt for doing it the day of weighing, and um, that's a typical kind of strategy. Obviously, it's all based on individual preferences. Um, yeah. And like the, the method of doing the water cut would be, you know, some people like the bath, some people like the sauna. Um, in terms of accessibility, if especially if you're competing. In a different country or overseas, I've been in so many scenarios where we've had to like find random saunas in random yeah. areas and cities, or ordering sauna tents and trying to hire a room to get a bath. So <laughs> that kind of scenario where people say, "Yeah, the, the bath is probably a, a more comfortable method because yeah, your your whole body isn't like in a sauna. You, your whole body's cooking, isn't it? You've got no way to really cool down. The bath is a little bit more. Well, some people don't like the bath, but we can go into a little bit of detail in a minute, but um, with the bath, you can have your team around you. You know, it's mm. a little bit more of a comfortable experience, but it's all down to accessibility of people got access to that when they are competing. So, um, waffled on a little bit there, actually. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, um, yeah, so in the final bit would be like the sauna or the bath. And, yeah, and then going to the, the weighing scenario, I'll give you a bit of a rundown on what... I'd what do you think that. about the got... sauna suit? See, I, I, this is a kind of opinion where I had with the, you know, when you're first starting off, you've got to give the the carbohydrates, the gram and stuff like that. The sauna suits, I was very against it. And being in Thailand, it's all about making the experience as comfortable as possible. Like fighters I know or I work with, I've run in sweatsuits, cut weight in sweatsuits for years and years and years. And that's like their kind of, comfort they know that mm. way mm-hmm. so i try and meet in the middle and go okay well i'll give you a scenario so smilla sundell who i work with um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. she likes to run in a sweatsuit and she had a couple of kilos to lose i was like i really want you to get you in the sauna because it's a little bit more comfortable you're running off a couple of kilos it's you know it's it's a little bit uncomfortable so like, right let's meet in the middle you you get in the sweatsuit you do a 15 20 minute run and then we do the rest in the sauna it's like okay and that psychologically just settles her a little bit instead of like I'm doing something completely different that I haven't done before. So my opinion, a long, long winded answer. My opinions kind of changed on it, but in terms of would I recommend doing a big, massive cut yeah. with a sweatsuit on in a sauna? Absolutely not. But mm-hmm. it's kind of meeting in the middle where it. Yeah, it, it seems like that's it, your approach. Yeah, your approach is genius because it's like a, a lot of people kind of underestimate the mental aspects of this game and it's like if you take fighters too much out of their comfort zone and not even i would say comfort zone it it is their comfort zone but if you take them into a place especially where they feel the most vulnerable is during the weight cutting process and then all the energy and tension that fight week brings and the potential of losing and, and and getting hurt and all these things and the family the friends you know the pressure the boyfriend the girlfriend all the things they've been going through up until this one point, that little bit of solace may be running for a little bit in their sauna suit, you know, because they're I, I, used to I, it. Well, I had that with Suplek in Japan where it was the first time he, he'd hired the nutritionist, you know. Mm-hmm. So I've heard from 
people who were there, he was a little bit nervous about the water court because he was doing something completely different. So I made the call the night before. I was like, right, I was originally going to just get him in the sauna, but then I was like, yeah. no, we'll get, we'll get him in the same scenario as Miller. we just get him in the, the sweatsuit, get him running for 15, 20 minutes, a little bit of a warm-up, and then we do the sauna. And mm-hmm. yeah, as you said, it, it, it's kind of meet, it's meeting in the middle and psychologically, they've started off that process, something that they've always done. So mm-hmm. it's not going in to a completely new scenario, blind and they're a little bit apprehensive. So yeah, that, that, that's yeah. my kind of approach. Cause you, 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 you see, look, this is the big thing about where you see a lot of online nutritionists now, online weight cut nutritionists, and they give all these things out on social media. But when you're there in person, the psychological game plays such a big impact and you'd only know that from being there. And I would have said the same things a couple of years ago, but traveling for the last two years and doing so many weight cuts, yeah. the psychological part is is just as important. Like language you use. You know, I've mm. when I first started off, I've said certain things and that's completely changed the mood. And now you know the <laughs> yeah. person, you know, yeah. you know what to say. You like sometimes you don't need to say anything. You need to be assertive at times, you need to be um relaxed it's you, you just don't get that from you don't get that from a degree you like yeah. learning about this 100%. You, you, need to, you need to be there in the trenches yeah. and and know and and and, and know and that that the psychological game is said it's just it's massive yeah if all you have as far as your toolkit is a hammer you're going to see every problem as a nail and then yeah. you're going to try to force these things to be that way and yeah. you know, like you said, you show up. You you gotta you gotta do this amount of grams of carbs immediately after. You must your pre workout meal must be this this and that. It's not realistic. Yeah. <laughs> People are not gonna do these things, and they may do them for a little while. But yeah. you're just trying to figure out how to fit within their system and optimize what they're already working on, working with. And yeah. you know, it, it's it's amazing what you're doing. And and I would like to speak or talk a little bit about the uh, traveling aspect, you know, because the cuisine changes, um, the access to certain foods change. How do you yeah. go about managing? Like you land in Japan or you land, you know, in Thailand, anywhere it's going to be changing constantly. So what's your yeah. approach to like finding the right food for these people? Well, I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of, I'll give you the Thailand scenario and I'll give you the Japan. So when I came to Thailand, yeah. it was only the first time I'd been to Thailand was, I think it was last year. Mm-hmm. Um, and start to get more fighters fighting at one championship and end up being last end of last year was I had to fight every week fighting at one championship. So like I need to do a bit of research and what what can we do to make the the weight cuts and I as easy as possible. So reached out mm. to a local meal prep company based in Bangkok. So like, right, I'm gonna have fighters every week. Can we do some kind of uh, deal and and like a plan around them? So they were more than happy to do that. So when a fighter Get to Bangkok now, even me not being there. I do the order for the meal pack company, they deliver it to the hotel, all tailored right. to them, all the kind of fight week foods that we need. Um, in terms of the weight cut, I know a company now that does that delivers the sauna tents because the, a lot of the one championship hotels don't have baths. So um, it's getting that connection where we can get a sauna tent delivered so they can cut weight in the room with the teammates around. It's just kind of doing that little bit of research and making them connections with people. So now I don't mm. necessarily have to be, I've got five people fighting on the, the prime card this weekend, or next weekend, but I know I've got everything prepared because I've done it multiple times now and yeah. they've got all, all the foods coming to their hotel. They don't have to stress about it and they don't have to go out the way and they don't have to look for, you know, when you go to Thailand, you think you're picking something, you know, low carb and healthy, but might be absolutely full of, of so yeah. <laughs> um, yeah yeah so it's kind of making their life as easy as possible and that just comes through research and repetition mm. with japan and that preparation was yeah preparation just and planning you know and even with when we talk about i guess because s- sometimes you know i, I do want to pull information out out of you about the highest level athletes but also it's like what the common hobbyist who trains like what mm. how it also applies to these people and and what yeah. you said that can apply in the same way, you know, is the preparation process, correct? It's like, okay, yeah. not just like, okay, I need to buy some food, so I'm just going to buy food now. Especially yeah. for people who are on that budget, who are trying to save a little bit more money and eat, you know, healthy. They can't just like, 
constantly just go to the store, go to your local Whole Foods in America. You know, it's like now you yeah. you know you're spending a lot more money if if you were just just reactive as far as yeah. you know the way that you choose to eat as as opposed to proactive. What you said there yeah. was just like meticulous planning. So like when you talk about sending the meal plans over to these companies, obviously you make the request. Don't put a ton of sodium or yeah. do you say no salt or what are they it's eating? Just, you know, they've they've got a luckily the one in Bangkok has got an option where you build your own box so you can select your proteins, your fats, um, and yeah. your vegetables. So it's it's all like you can pick and mix so it's it's actually really handy to use and um, it's been it's been definitely a lifesaver in terms of the the one championship stuff with japan mm -hmm. too um japan's probably a little bit more what would be the word to explain i thought it'd be a little bit more difficult to get the to plan the um the food but reached out to a meal prep company luckily the person who owned the meal prep company was australian he jumped on the call <laughs> me straight away um, organized the meals they cook i told them i i just basically had my fight week meals i sent them yeah. over to him and said can you cook that like not a problem cooked it came to the hotel vacuum packed all sorted for super Life on fight week it was just um what are the meals that you you uh you you basically request and have them eat? so typ typical things are, like a popular one that i have is satay chicken so having mm -hmm. like a low low salt peanut butter um like satay chicken thighs, which is like quite a high calorie meal, but it's mm. still adopting them fight week strategies. Big, big popular one is is I have lamb meatballs, like lamb kofta meatballs, which is also I because I try and think right, you can you can you can strip things back and be as, as simple as proper and give them boiled chicken and you know boil a grilled fish, or you can make things a little bit exciting. And I think yeah. it comes from. I've actually got a chef qualification, so I'm always trying to think of things. What can we do to make that fight week experience just that little bit better? You know, that, yeah. that five percent better. What can what can I do? And looking at sources that you can implement, and that makes such a difference to a fighter when they're on fight week. Like I'm eating good shit here. Like the amount of what are some of the sauces that you're putting in there? Like it's like a tomato based sauce, so um, yeah. with like herbs and spices that are low, like same principles like low sodium sauces. So you can make a pretty good, um, like pasta sauce just from like tin tomatoes, a little bit of paprika, mixed herbs, and you're adding that to you know some meatballs. That doesn't really feel like a fight week kind of yeah yeah. Meal. Like, sounds to bad. Press to say oh yeah, that sounds like really good, and yeah, even little things like desserts, little protein. Um, what are some desserts protein. that you love to like, make? Like a peanut butter cup is one that I've been doing quite a lot recently. So get some peanut butter and put it in a like a baking tray, a little bit of melted chalk chip, only a little bit, just kind of a bit of a layer, yeah. put it in the freezer. And that's that's quite a, like a high calorie snack that you can have throughout the day. And Dude, another one would yeah. be... I'm making that. <laughs> another one would be like a like a, a zero calorie jelly. Do you like the zero sugar jellies? Mm, yep, you yep. The yep. jelly, like jelly pots and yep. like some... Um, whipped cream like something like yeah. that a little bit of whipped, and it's just like a high calorie snack for them to have so it's just all it's like my my thing is always making just that thing a little bit better for them what can we do just to yeah. take the stress off um and make fight week as enjoyable as possible yeah. so um yeah it's con constantly in 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 the lab thinking of new uh, new things to kind of implement and then from a year round perspective, like, you know, when people are just training, I guess you would say it's between training camp, uh, between training camps, but they're just training and they're staying in shape. What, yeah. what would you recommend to them, you know, to your fighters and athletes to be eating on a year round basis outside of training camp? I think it's just hitting the foot as long as you're getting the fundamentals, right? So you're, you're eating good carbs, you're getting the carbs to fuel you for your training sessions, the carbohydrates for recovery. You're hitting the protein, you're having high protein meals, you're spreading them out evenly throughout the day, you're getting good sleep, your stress mm. management is good. That's like what we spoke about before. The stress management is key. Like, how are you managing your stress? Are you having, are you, you're getting at least seven, eight hours of sleep a night? And what do you recommend to people, I guess, with the stress management piece? I think, it's, I think I try and do like a tick list and go, right, well, what's, what's, what's stressful at the moment? 
And you yeah. go, well, what, like, what's work like a scale of one to 10? What's training like? Is the you know, family like, what things can you kind of improve? Because stress is a big, stress is a big thing in terms yeah. of stress can impact your weight. When people are stressed, that can um, make you hold on to a little bit of water weight. Stress can also impact in terms of the female, it can have an impact on the female cycle. So the, the stress management side is is, is definitely important, especially in, in fight camp, because it's such a, you go from out of camp to fight camp, the whole kind of intensity goes up then. But in terms of out of camp, I think if you just, yeah, you, you're hydrate, you're keeping hydrated. You're hitting your carbohydrate recommendation, making sure you you feel for training sessions. Not necessarily hitting specific numbers as you spoke about. Yes. The protein intake's high. Yeah, opting for good sources of protein, lean meats, you know, dairy, eggs, or if you're vegan, you're hitting good vegan protein sources. If you can't hit them targets, maybe implement, you know, a protein supplement. You're getting good sleep. Your stress management's good. And as long as you're kind of hitting them targets you, you're kind of halfway there and that's when you you can maybe go dial down and go okay when well, we need to hit specific targets mm. and carbs and protein yeah. but you need to hit them things first right yeah right before you kind of go into the nitty-gritty things yeah. yeah a lot of times i guess people they kind of avoid even starting because they spend so much time in the the, the planning and the optimization process and then they're like, you know, that seems so overwhelming. So I'm just going to eat candy all day and drink well, soda and eat cheeseburgers. Thing. Oh, I need to, I'm, I'm starting camp again. And they go, well, what supplements are going to help me? Well, what are you doing? <laughs> what, 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 what's your diet like? You need to, like, yeah. the, the supplements isn't going to just suddenly, like, you know, to, you taking creatine is not going to suddenly just turn you into Superman. And you're like, what are you eating? What, what's your daily diet first? And then we can kind yeah. of go into the nitty gritty. It's like the fine yeah. details. and. Yeah, it's just hitting them fundamentals. And I always say, I've said, said like numerous posts, if you get the fundamentals right, you're halfway there and then you can fine tune things um, a little bit more tailored to yourself. You know, well, you know what, when I'm training in the afternoon on a Tuesday, I usually get really tired on, after the training or, or before. Okay, well, I know on a Tuesday I maybe need to bump my calves up a little bit more. But then on the, on the Friday, I feel like, I've already got one session a day. I feel like I'm eating too much. Okay, well, on the Friday, you don't need to eat as much. It's just like little tweaks here and there. And then like the protein amount, um, I know uh, the pound, the gram per pound is kind of what people say, you know, obviously for America, for kilograms, what, what is it typically? It's two grams per kilogram of body, body mass per typically. Yep, makes sense. Recommend. 2 .2. Yeah, so yeah, if you're 70 kilos, 140 grams of protein a day and then just spreading them out because um, a lot of people tend to have the lowest dose of protein for the breakfast. Then they have like a, oh. like a reasonable amount of protein for their lunch. And then they, a lot of people tend to have the highest amount of the daily protein intake in, in the evening. So spreading them out even throughout the day. So, you know, say you, yeah. you need to hit 140 grams, 30 grams in the morning, 30 grams at your lunch, maybe a, a protein snack in the afternoon and then a protein protein based dinner. And then, as I mentioned, if you if you're struggling to hit them targets, that may maybe when you need to have the conversation of implementing the protein supplements to hit mm. to hit that. Um, yeah, that's a lot of things that I when we can talk about supplements, but in terms like supplement, I try and keep it like yeah. as simple as possible because the first thing people mm -hmm. go for is like what supplements to take. Yeah, and and the supplements, like you said, creatine. You know, obviously the most research. And, you know, one of the best supplements in the game is as far as also the price, you know, you can buy it in bulk and yeah. basically have it forever for like 20 bucks. <laughs> you know, it's, it's insane. Yeah, I've, I think I've had mine for it. I think it's, I think I got it in March and I've still got some left. It's <laughs> exactly. I've got tons left. It's insane. Yeah. I, I have so much. I'm like, oh, this is, this is pretty nice. And then, um, I think you also mentioned beta, beta alanine in a couple of podcasts, yeah. which I, yeah. I don't like the, 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 the it's itchy really feeling, but. Yeah. Man, I definitely seen a difference in numbers and, and, and you know, just power in general. So, you yeah. know, the, the juice is worth the squeeze on that one. You know, yeah, I definitely, definitely feel that. So, and then what are some of the, uh, you know, when I, when I think about like, just when I think about like the different dietary approaches, even like fasting, you know, cause I, I've read and researched that some, you really can't absorb, like you said, let's say you're 70 kilos, right? 
you can't absorb 140 grams uh, of protein, you know, in one meal. So, so it's like some of these people are eating maybe once or twice a day. Are you able to fast like that often? Or do you recommend that, you know, people doing this sport eat more than a few times a day, obviously? I think, uh, again, it kind of goes back to the conversation of where how it fits with their lifestyle. Like the ideal scientific approach would be, okay, we'd want you to, to spread their meals throughout the day, but then sometimes mm. people's lifestyles don't fit that. So sometimes it's, it, it's the case of as long as you're getting that in, then that's the most important thing. Like the same with people, mm. people ask me about intermittent fasting and, you know, you know, this approach to 10 to 12 or 1 to whatever, and go, well, does it fit your lifestyle? I say, well, you know, I can't, I struggle to get a meal in the morning. Do you, does you doing that, do you feel tired during training or feel okay? It's like having that tick list and going, if it fits with you, then we can potentially look into that. But then if, you, if the people are just doing it for some kind of weight loss, magic yeah. supplement kind of... Yeah. Formula, um, I don't typically recommend like the fasting or like yeah intermittent fasting kind of approach. And also, you know, new new diets that are super popular. People listen to Joe Rogan and they're like, "Oh, dude, I'm just gonna eat ribeyes all day," <laughs> and it's like, or keto or what it may whatever it may yeah. be. You know, what, what's your opinions? I guess on uh, some of these different dieting, you know, protocols and yeah. and, and meals. I think- for a ketogenic diet, for the, the, the general person who's just training and you know wants to lose a little bit of weight and, and same thing if it fits the lifestyle and they enjoy that type of food, then great. But for a fighter, it's probably probably one of the worst diets you can you can adopt really, because high intensity exercise, which fighters do, is fueled by carbohydrates. So if you're not getting carbohydrates in your system, I like to give the analogy of you no know, putting unleaded petrol or diesel into an F1 or NASCAR, for example, like the car's going to go, but it's going to gas yeah. out pretty quickly. So that's why I can't, like my reference to ketogenic diet. Yeah, it'll be good. But you, what I tend to get from the people who have adopt, adopted that diet, it's the same kind of problems. I felt really tired. I was gassing out during training. And it's just a, like a continuous trend for that. So for the fighter, like absolutely Absolutely not. And I've had a lot of debates with people online and go, well, it worked for me. I felt good in me, in me fight. And this is no disrespect for people, but it'd be, it'd be like John, who's an amateur fighter, who's doing a white collar event. I think, yeah, for the top, top level, there's, 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 the diet can be the difference potentially between learning and losing and that kind of thing. It's, I, I, I also give the scenario is, if they found out that cornflakes could improve a fighter's performance by 50%, I, I'd adopt, I'd say, off for that. But the research of the ketogenic diet isn't there. So you're always trying to stick to the research. And it, it's continuously showed the ketogenic diet that it's just not optimal for yeah. high intensity. Like long duration, Jordan and stuff, there's a little bit promising research there. But for anything, like you know yourself, when you're absolutely smashing pads, training two, three times a day, and you're having steak and steak and eggs you ain't you ain't feeling good after no after that after a, a few days on that you, you're gonna no. start to feel really tired and people say oh this keto adapted and it's like it's, yeah it's, it's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is bullshit dude honestly i've i, I think i've tried the, i've tried those diets because man i love steak so i'm like shit yeah. hey you'll be leaner and you do look you composition wise you do look pretty lean and i, I yeah. didn't see that much of a drop off in muscle tissue but I did notice that like I was not able to crack the, the pads as, as hard or even holding them, you know, and, and being as, as to, to really push the pace on the fighters that I'm, you know, training. So it's like, like, this is a difficult process. I, I could see how maybe if you have like slow, long, you know, marathon running styles, you know, activities, yeah, it might work out. Have you yeah. noticed a difference? I know you work with um, Muay Thai fighters and MMA fighters and obviously yeah. probably a, a in between as well. So have you noticed a difference in the approach at all? Do you know what? There's, there's not that much, of, like from my experience now, there's not that much of a, a kind of difference. The, 
in MMA, people tend to call it a little bit more weight, yeah. a little bit more kind of weight focus because the I think there's a kind of passed down belief that you know the more weight you cut, the the the, the better you are for size advantage, which I can kind of understanding part in, in terms of like your ground game and stuff like that. If you're, if you're a lot smaller, then you would say that does have an impact. But there's so there's so many cogs to a fighter's game, like nutrition mm. and body composition. It's a tiny it's a tiny part. There's so many other other factors, psychological, yeah, yeah. tactical, you know, mental. It's um I like the studies have shown that the amount of weight that you lose and regain doesn't necessarily determine your success in the ring. So if you, you cut a load of weight, it doesn't necessarily mean that. This was in MMA, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be more successful. It, yeah. It, so. Yeah, the biggest fighter of every weight class, the biggest fighter of every weight class typically isn't the champion in every weight class. Yeah. And they don't typically have the longest reign in every weight class. Um, yeah. And I would say there's exceptions to this, like especially when you see Aljamain Sterling had a decently good experience, yeah. you know, at 135, he was, he was massive, but there are people, yeah. believe it or not, bigger than him in that weight class and they're not yeah. the champion either. So, yeah. um, and then, you know, you've got John Jones, he has the longest reach, but he's definitely not the biggest person in yeah. light heavyweight as far as just like overall size. Now he could be, because obviously he's a heavyweight, he's insanely big. Um, you know, and I wouldn't have expected there to be too much of a difference as far as the approach, because a lot of the demands are the same, you know, yeah. be explosive, being also able to, um, it's, a, it's like, uh, an explosive endurance athlete, which the demands for, um, MMA and Muay Thai are very similar. And it's crazy because it's nothing like, there's nothing like combat sports in being yeah. so explosive for so long. And being able to recover in such a short period of time, you know, and like you said, there's so many different factors that play into this. It's kind of insane. Are, are, are there some new things that you've recently found? Because you're a person who constantly cites, you know, science and studies, which is great. But you're also, you know, beyond that, you're, you're, you're in the practitioner phase. You're on the ground floor while you're watching these things. You're, you're watching them develop in person. I think from my personal experience, definitely the big weight cut impact the, the gas tank in the final line, 100, 100%. I've seen mm -hmm. that for fights that I've worked with. Big, big weight cut when it comes to like a three, like the end of the you know second, or if it's a five round fight, it definitely has an impact on the engine. Um, that's just from my personal experience. Um, in terms of, I'm trying to think anything else that's kind of. I mean, that's a huge trend, even if it was just that. That yeah. that like that that mentality is also so major in America because oh, yeah, this so is a you, you see it on comments. Go well, you know if when I've done posts about you know things about moving up weight class, why it could be good for your your health, your mental health. I mean, you go well. That means I'm gonna be blah blah, blah and, and it's so ingrained in people's heads that yeah, like they need to cut loads of weight because they're gonna be mm -hmm. bigger. But what happens when you do a big weight cut? Because a lot of people do these big weight cuts. You don't hire nutritionists. They do it on their own. They don't do the refuel properly because they have no idea. They just drink what they want, eat what they want. So they haven't yeah. optimally refueled, rehydrated. They go in, they go yeah. into the ring, the cage, and then they just gas out. Or oh, another side of things is they get clipped. And because they've done mm -hmm. a big weight cut, they haven't rehydrated properly. And you've seen, you've probably seen it yourself. Someone's been clipped. Like, how did yeah. they knock out? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and in MMA, one of the biggest examples that I saw um, was TJ Dillashaw. When he cut yeah. down to fight Henry Cejudo, it was insane. You know, yeah. it's like, that guy does not look okay. And it's like, he ate yeah. one shot and it was done. You know, and it wasn't even like that devastating of a shot. So it just shows yeah. like that brain is going to shut off. The fluid that was protecting your brain is, you know, it's, you probably took that away too. So from yeah. that rehydration process, I definitely would like you to cover that. Yep. Yeah. Um, so typically the fluid recommendations um, so this this is the, the crazy thing about combat sports is all the research in terms of carbohydrate recommendations, uh, rehydration is all come from other sports. So it's not mm. been set on you know fighters themselves. Come from endurance sports, soccer, mainly mainly a lot of stuff is from endurance sports. And so typically, what you'd recommend you've done a weight cut when you sweat, you lose water and electrolytes. And um, so main thing is getting 
a, a water and electrolyte solution in you post weighing. So um, sodium's the main electrolyte lost in sweat. So you want a high sodium content of the electrolytes in the, in the fluid. So if you lose a kilo of fluid, you want to time it by 1.5. If you lose a kilo, you drink 1.5 liters of fluid. Um, so that's like that. That's a big thing that a lot of fighters don't do is they don't. You might have seen itself where someone weighs in and they just at the amount of time I've seen just plain water being drank at a weigh in is is unbelievable. And they're just they're just, yeah. just sculling big bottle of water. And what ends up happening is they drink it too quick. The fighters end they up go straight to the bathroom. Piss it. Yeah, piss it out. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> when you lose when you lose um when you sweat you lose water and electrolytes but you lose more water and electrolytes so then if you say that's like that's that's water that's electrolytes and that goes down and you, but then if you replace it with just water you dilute the blood then so the mm. kidneys go shit we need to filter that out a bit because the body's the body tries to protect itself from fluid overload too so then the kidneys mm. go shit we need to filter this out and you end up pissing a lot of it out um so electrolytes critically important and um, all the stuff for like you see it now with the prime energy drinks and, and the rehydration <laughs> they're like absolutely yeah. awful so you need to look for like a good brand like sodium content's like the most important so mm. typically you'd want something around above like 400 milligrams of sodium and um, a saving um or even using like i don't know what's like in the us is like hydride diorite like the oral yeah, this, this stuff like Pedialyte that Pedialyte, has tons Pedialyte, of sugar in it. So, yeah, something like that is 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 quite good to have post weighing. Yeah. Um, sports. Would you recommend? Also. Would you recommend things that have more sugar in it or no sugar in it? There, we do have yeah, like so, electrolyte. Yeah. So so um, glucose can actually help the transport of fluid mm. from the gut. Okay. Um, so when you help, uh, someone you, you drink the fluid, goes to the stomach. So glucose can actually help you absorb that fluid from the stomach. So um like sports drinks are also good. Um because it delay like because they've got a carbohydrate content, it can actually mm. while going too scientific, it, it can actually delay the absorption um of fluid from your stomach. So you get a, a prolonged release of fluid into your system, whereas comparison where you're just drinking pure water post weighing, that'll just yeah. go straight out to the bladder. So I'll give it a, a scenario. So initially, say you've done, you put two, three kilos away in. First thing would be water, electrolyte solution. Say a liter, a liter and a half over the first hour. Then typically after the first hour, I'd introduce maybe a Gatorade, a couple of Gatorades. Um, and then stuff like, like another good one is chocolate milk because chocolate milk's got a good sodium content, carbohydrate content too. Um, so really kind of like sugary, good electrolyte content um, for the refuel stuff. Um, i trying to think, the, the, so the, like the rehydration stuff, the carbohydrate recommendations, so typical carbohydrate recommendations, uh, eight to 10 grams per kilogram body mass. So say you fight at 70 kilos, times by 10, 700 grams of carbs, and people think, how the fuck am I gonna get 700 grams of carbs in? post weighing but it's all about what carbohydrates you, you use so the sports okay. drinks you know they're 30 40 grams of carbs are saving you know jellies you want to be having like introduced light light carbohydrates yeah. so what, what about rice do, yeah so rice definitely but what a lot of fighters do will you'll weigh in and they'll have a big meal straight away have a big yeah. meal big rice meal and then they're like shit i feel really really full now i need to lie yeah. down yeah you don't eat for a couple of hours, you're too full, and that delays the recovery strategy. So you yep. want to be, you want to kind of go for a continuum where it's fluid first, and then slowly introduce light snacks, and then go to a more solid meal. So, like, what are a couple of light snacks? So, an easy one, maybe like jam, jam or honey on a bit of bread, oh. some jellies, yep. jelly sweets, stuff like that. A cereal's a good one too. So, introduce like light snacks, and then. Go cocoa pops is always a um, a popular one for the the post yeah. weighing snacks, and then say yeah. like two hours later, go for you know chicken rice type of dish, white rice. Yeah. You want to be avoiding any kind of fibrous foods, and um, because mm. same scenario make you feel a little bit yeah. full, might cause some GI discomfort. So typical meal would be like white rice, 
good lean piece of chicken, maybe a little bit of soy sauce, sweet chili sauce. Joker's has got the sodium content too to um, help with the electrolyte replacement. Or a pasta dish is a good one. Um, mm. And then throughout the day, say you're weighing in at 12 o'clock, you have your first big meal at 2 o'clock. Still mm. introducing them light snacks throughout the day, maybe getting two, three decent meals in. Um, and also it goes to the what we spoke about before where you can you can give this structured time by time um timeline on, on the refuel and then you come yeah. to the you come to the way and they're like i'm not that hungry i am hungry so i kind of give the scenario where get the rehydration stuff in we want to get you the fluid replaced and then if it comes to eight you weigh in at 12 it comes to eight nine o'clock at night and you want an ice cream or you want a chocolate bar then we've done we've done the the majority of the work now then go and do it like i've yeah. I've been with guys where they want to have a bit, bit of cake and you'd say what yeah. like after the but it's all about the psychological thing as well they've yes. done a big weight do you, do you want to do that as long as you've got we know roughly that we've got the fluid in yet over them that yeah. course of the post weighing and we've had a decent amount of carbs in yeah. if you want to have that light enjoyable snack in the evening time then so be it yeah that's that's amazing and you know that that really it's 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 smart to actually have the approach and like you said all kinds of things could be weird like maybe the weigh-ins are a little bit later maybe the fighters yeah. not able to eat right now they feel a little off so it's like figuring out what the most important pieces are checking yeah. those boxes off yeah. and then it's like okay allowing some wiggle room it's like having a you know from a music perspective having a tight set allows you to actually be able to improv pieces improvisation in certain areas because now you understand like the framework. It's like, I know where I need to go. I know what I should do and I have to do. It's like tier list on a to-do list. It's like, this is red, yeah. this is orange, this is yellow. This is, you know, this is side quest stuff. I, I should do this stuff, but if I don't, it's not make it or break it. And then yeah, for the water cut, the rehydration, not the rehydration piece, but I know water loading is obviously like an important piece of this. I yeah. know some people do it too early or I, I know some people may not drink enough water or too much water. What do you recommend there? So it's another one of them things where my opinion slightly changed on it, where I was very mm. textbook and you do your water load and strategy. Typically the, the science has shown that it's only really three days of water load that you need. And this is actually was with combat sports. I think it was like maybe 50, 10, 15 grapplers and the, say the fight week scenario was, they started on the Monday, the water, and the weighing was the Friday. So the water load Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, um, 100 mil per kilogram of body mass. So, example again, 70 kilos, seven, seven liters for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then they went to 15 mil per kilo on the Thursday, which I think is around for the 70 kilo fighter, maybe 1.2 liters, and then nothing until the weighing. Um, and the, the study shown when when they adopted that with the fight week strategies, they lost, um, I think it was 2% more body weight compared to the control group, which didn't water load, wow. which is good. But at the same time, you've got to think about if you're a big, if you're, you're fighting at a big weight class, I've had guys fighting yeah. at 90 kilos, drinking nine meters for three days. That's, that's a hard job. So my, my kind of opinion has changed where keep the fluid intake above normal. So if your fluid intake is four liters a day, have six liters a day, five and a half, six liters a day, just have it above average, uh, above normal, mm -hmm. sorry. You don't have to be obsessed with getting it to the absolute T. Like the amount of mess I've had, I've, I've meant to be drinking six liters. I've only drank 6.8 today and we're going to be okay. It's like, dude, we're <laughs> going to be cool. Like that's the, like, yeah. don't need to be obsessed as long as you're, you're hitting them ranges. So yeah. that's another thing like yeah that that i've kind of my opinion changed slightly on it it's just yeah. the the cost benefit of especially with the big guys you drinking nine liters a day it's it's a sh it's pretty shit, really yeah so oh, dude, could you I, get away I fucking could you hate that shit. could you get away with drinking seven liters and have the same benefit i'd say yeah most likely yes um yes so it's all kind of the path of least resistance but if it's a smaller person you know the fighting the you know, 50s 60s and they're already having four liters a day. Having an extra two liters isn't a massive, mm. massive amount. But yep, yep, yeah. Um, yeah, but that's what we said before. It's the only kind of getting that from kind of experience and being with the fighters on fight week and seeing yeah. them trying to 
really struggle with that fluid intake and for maybe an extra you might be losing an extra percent is it yeah you've got to kind of weigh up the the, the cost benefit of it? yeah yeah and with the creatine i know like um i didn't even know this before but you had said that not on not on this session but that it was a myth that you have to cut creatine out during the weight cutting process in the week of yeah well you, you, and that's you insane to me that's awesome well, the thing with creatine is, is like, there was a study back in, I think, in the 80s where they loaded with creatine and they put on yeah. maybe a kilo and a half and everyone's mind. Like, yeah. that's been, like, the long-standing belief that yeah. you have creatine, you put on this, um, you put on weight, water weight. So it only happens typically when you, when you creatine load, which is 20 grams a day for five days. That's a typical creatine loading strategy. Mm-hmm. But that kind of normalizes after a period of time. So if you, you started taking creatine a couple, mm-hmm. couple of months before you fight, you're not going to, there's no point removing it from your diet because it's not going to, you're not going to stop taking it. If you're just yeah. having a maintenance dose of five grams and all of a sudden you, the weight's going to drop off it. It doesn't kind of work like that. But I think it's that, that bro science myth where. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you, you need to stop <laughs> taking it. Like people like. The, the way I look at it, you're taking, you, you start taking creatine and you think something magical is going to happen and the weight's just going to fall off. You're obsessed with maybe like you might have a tiny little bit of water retention, yeah. like, very small. You've got bigger issues to worry about. If you're, if you're obsessed on fight with like, the creatine's the main thing I need to do, then dude, you've got, you've, you need to focus on a lot of like other important things. And um, yeah. well, as I said, that you, Typically, when you do a creatine load, you do get a a little bit of a water retention increase. But would I recommend someone two weeks out start taking creatine? Probably not. But if someone's been taking yeah. it throughout camp, five grams a day, would I say on fight week stop taking it? No, carry on taking yeah. it. Yeah, because I had been recommending that to to my fighters a lot. Like, hey, you know, just cut it out now, and then once you are done, you know, then get right back on it. Which is well, it, now, it is like high, high responders and low responders to creatine. Like yeah. some people do get get a, a, a bit of water intention from it, but the general the general research shows that it's there's only you know, you know same with any kind of research. There's means and averages, and some people are outliers. Yeah, the, the amount of weight cuts I've done, and, and people are still taking it. There's, I've never seen anything kind of. But same thing again, if that's peace of mind, you're not taking it for a few days. If you want to stop taking it, then yeah. that I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be against it, but it's not gonna suddenly you look in the mirror after two days of crazy and go, oh, shit, I've I've lost two kilos here. It's not it doesn't Seriously. Really Yeah, because I recommend it and I take it myself, not mostly for the actual physical aspects, but the cognitive aspects. Yeah. And, you know, I guess especially just like the research on traumatic brain injuries and, you know, even these micro concussions you're getting, if you spar X amount of times, when you really sit down and do the numbers, you're like, okay, if I'm a very defensive fighter, if I spar five times a week, (laughs) I'm still going to get hit probably about 10 times each one of those sessions. We're talking about 50 times a week, 50 times four. Then the numbers start to really add up. You know, oh shit. You know, this is why I'm so impulsive. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, like that's a, that's one like creatine got so many benefits now, and even stuff with they've done stuff like depression and, and mental mm. health. Like, there's so many amazing stuff from it now, and the cost benefit of having it, it just there's, there's so many benefits to it, and yeah. the, with the brain health, and I gave a scenario um, in a podcast where you're taking it, it might make you switched on that a little bit more. There's been research about mm. attention spans and memory. And cognitive mm. benefits. So, if something that you can have may improve your performance by half a percent, fraction percent, yeah. then yeah. It, it, it's a worthwhile thing to take. Yeah, and the same with fish oil, right? Like a lot of yeah, really yeah. good benefits if you don't get enough fish in your diet. Yeah, yeah, and then you know, like you said, all these 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 fractions. It's like small things all add up into one big thing. Especially yeah. if you take that approach and and the idea of of like just turning that mindset on that like it's not one big thing it's a cumulative yeah. effect that kind of yeah. just adds up it's like okay this is this one piece of instead of you know like just keeping my hand limp 
I strengthen it. Then when I catch yeah. that jab, it's a little bit stronger. You know, that one thing alone probably won't win a fight. But yeah. then if you have that same mentality towards so many other things, it's like, boom, these things come together. And that one piece, or just having the mentality of fixing this one thing, and then keep on going through overall consistency, you become something totally unrecognizable. You it's know? like and, sweating, and I do realize sweating it's small huge. stuff, isn't it? Like sweating the small stuff is like, that's, that, that's like a key thing to do, just them little things and just adding that kind of extra layer on. You might, even if you're improving like by a percent a week, you're still moving forward, yes. aren't you? You're not going backwards. And you would, like, you would wish you could improve by a percent a week. You know, that fucking, yeah. per, that would be insane if you could, but you can't. And some, sometimes it'll seem like there's a regression, but as long as you keep going, there's never yeah. been a person who just continuously goes and continuously focus, focuses and, and analyzes and reviews and reflects over 10 years didn't get better at all, especially if they have well, some sort of natural talent, right? For yeah. the thing. If you well, have I zero talent, yourself, you'll still get better. I look at yourself a business and go, what, what have I done this week? Or what can I add? Or, you know, even look yeah. at like the, the data for like you know, stuff like social media pages. Oh, you, you, your page is grown by half a percent a week. Well, you're moving in the right direction, aren't you? Or you're getting that much, you're getting that many more people contacting you. You're always yeah. moving forward, even if it's by a small percentage. Mm -hmm. So that's a kind of my my outlook on just general life as well. As long as you're doing something, you you head in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, with the fighters too, they're doing, they're doing things that are just you know adding adding the tools to the toolbox. And yes. yeah, it, it, it definitely. Yeah, um, and like yeah, was like nutrition now and. Fighters are getting S and C coaches. They're getting mindset coaches. They're getting that full mm -hmm. team now. Whereas, you know, ten, fifteen years ago, it was just the fight and the coach. The nutritionist yeah, wasn't even like thing. And like, no, the yeah, fighters yeah, yeah. now, especially the top level, they've got you know, five, six different people around them, and it's 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 um, it's exciting to see because you you're in a space where it's continuously evolving, and to see what's going to be yeah. like in ten, fifteen years, like the FCPI stuff and. The research coming out, like one of my good friends in Perth, he's doing combat sports PhD and um, doing all research on hydration. So wow. you know, being really good friends with him, getting like the latest research and trying to translate it, try and translate that into practice. It's like it's a um, it's a cool cool space to be a part of. Moment. Yeah, you know, and for you guys watching this, you can follow Peter on Condition Period Nutrition is your Instagram page, right? Yeah, condition dot nutrition, I think. It, yeah, it, should, be the first thing same, same. it should be the first yep. thing that comes up, I think, yeah. And, and, you know, what ways and capacities, I guess, what services do you offer to be able to help, you know, people right now? Um, so generally, my, my, predominantly my work is with fighters. So, you know, in and out of fight camp, um, people who want fight camp plans or people who are trying to get into, you know, good shape, out to camp, maintain that, you know, Good body composition, good habits, um, and yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty much predominantly my work. Um, How do they reach you? Do. How do they sign up? Yeah, so typically just on Instagram is the best best way of um, contacting me or my email address, but mainly mainly through Instagram. And um, yeah, I used to kind of work with people like who weren't fighters, but it came to the, like the business side of things where I didn't actually enjoy working. With with just the general public, I, I, I yeah, got to yeah. the point where it's like I, I, my passion is with fighters and working yeah. with people who want to constantly get better. I find when you tend to work with people who've just got an arbitrary goal, or I want to lose five kilos, yeah. it's 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 not. People don't commit to that. I love with yeah. fighters like they've got this goal. They have to they have to make that weight. They have to do this, and um, yeah. it's always it's just like a constant challenge, which um, which is. Just yeah, I, for me it doesn't feel like work. It just feels like a really, really good kind of hobby lifestyle thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hundred percent. That and that that's that's kind of where I try to go at. It's like, okay, does it check all four of these boxes off? Is yeah. it a passion project? Yeah, like th that has to be number one to me because I won't do anything unless there's a passion project. Uh, next, will I make money from it? Because there's so many things I can do. Why shouldn't yes. I make money from the thing I'm doing? Yeah, and yeah. it's like, okay, does this actually have an impact? If it has no fucking impact, why even, why even do it at all, right? And yeah. then the last piece is like, is this good for long-term 
opportunities for myself. So it's yeah. like not short-term thinking, not short-term mindset. Can I do this? And it doesn't affect, you know, anything in the long term. Like that's like basically in a short way, just don't sell out. Don't be a fucking yeah. idiot. Don't be a person yeah, yeah. who is selling out for no reason, you know? Well, like, like, the thing with me is, well, I get people like supplement companies, people, oh, do you want to do this? And then yeah. I'm like, that's not my values. Like, yeah, I've got no. a big follow on my page and you could easily go down that route and go and, and, yeah. and advertise things and do that. And it's like, that's not what I'm about. I'm, I'm about like, you know, helping the fighters and doing what I think, like my page, I post things that I think is important and I don't kind of look at anybody else. I just go, right, this is important to me. Um, this is what I think should be going out to the fighters or people should know about this. And I think when you just got them core values and you know what's important to you, because it's very easy. You probably see it on social media. People are doing the same thing. Yes. Speaking to the camera, doing the same stuff. And yep. people, aren't, people aren't real anymore. It's just a character. And yeah. I feel like with me, I, I'm, I'm pretty genuine. I'm a good person to work with. And I think that comes across with the people on my page and the people I work with. And I think when you stick to that and you, go, and you go away from that, and you're going away from your values, yeah, you could make, X amount more money, but no. you're not really being yourself. And um, yeah. yeah, it's um, it's always good to just know you know your why, isn't it? And once you know your why, yeah. you've got that kind of beacon to follow. One hundred percent. And you know, I, I'm super excited to continue to follow your journey and all the things that you're doing. You know, super impressive. And I know everybody is going to take a lot from this. You know, I'll try to make some. Uh, not try. I will make some. Uh, some actionable things that people can take from this interview. Cause I know sometimes people just want it easier and, and, and honestly, I value people's time. So I'm going to yeah. figure out things that from this and, you know, make some uh, downloadable things that people can get right to action. You know, they don't even have to listen to this entire thing, but I think it's obviously worth the listen. And I appreciate the time. Pleasure, mate. Been a, been a good chat. Thank you so much, man. Thank you for being here. Okay. See, you soon, mate. See you soon.